In April of 1991, 34-year-old Gordon Collins went on a vacation trip to Baja California, Sur, Mexico. He was accompanied by his girlfriend Anastasia Seals and another couple Wayne Schwartz and Arlene Burlington. On April 23rd, the group rented a boat from a local hotel and went on a fishing trip in the Sea of Cortez. As they left the port, a fisherman warned them about a storm that was brewing. However, the group believed they would return to the port before the storm hit. In the afternoon, strong winds and high seas developed, but the group had still not made it back. The next day, when the boat had still not returned, an air and water search was carried out for the missing group. Later that day, bodies of Wayne Schwartz and Anastasia Seals was found floating in the water about 28 miles northeast. It is believed the group's boat had capsized in the storm. Despite extensive search, Gordon and Orlean's body were never found and were assumed to be lost at sea. However, in the days that followed, there were a number of reported sightings of Gordon after the accident. His parents believe Gordon survived and had been picked up by a fisherman. They believe he may have been suffering from amnesia. They traveled to Baja, California in hopes of finding any information that could help them find their son. Soon they found two fishermen who claimed to have seen a man matching Gordon's description coming out of the ocean and trying to get on a bus. They said he was only wearing his shorts and had cuts all over his body. They also found a man named Jose Peralta who said he had seen a man matching Gordon's description on a nearby beach. While following leads, his parents made their way to La Paz. They talked to a worker at a taco stand who told them he had seen Gordon an hour earlier. They travelled a little farther and another witness said he had seen him about half an hour ago. As they made their way into the town, another witness said he had seen him just five minutes ago. However, they could not find anyone who had seen him after that and they hit a dead end. After this lead did not pan out, his parents returned to the US. In the next few months, there would be at least 50 sightings of Gordon throughout La Paz and Cabo San Lucas. Gordon's parents decided to hire a private investigator, Bill Garcia, who notified the newspapers in Baja California and articles about Gordon were published. Soon, Garcia received reports that Gordon was seen living in the village of Colonia Vicina Guerrero a few months ago. Several citizens remembered seeing him disheveled and wandering around the village begging for food. At one point, he was caught stealing food and arrested. The local police called an American translator named James Hatfield to help translate for the man. When Hatfield was shown a photograph of Gordon, he said, There is no doubt in my mind it's Gordon. Because when I met with him in jail, I introduced myself to him and he gave me his name, Gordy. And then when the flyers came out, it's right there on the flyer, Gordon. And you can't get the two pictures mixed up. It's the same. However, he was released from prison shortly after and despite extensive searches, Gordon's parents have been unable to find him. There were numerous sightings in the following months. The US consulate has now officially reversed its position and Gordon is no longer presumed dead. Gordon's last reported sighting was near the village of Rosarita and the case remains unsolved. On March 23, 2015, in the heart of Mexico City, in the Juarez neighborhood, a man found a suitcase abandoned on the sidewalk. The man tried to move the suitcase to the side, but it was very heavy. Curious, he opened the suitcase and found the body of a little girl inside. He immediately notified police. Forensic experts were called in and it was determined that the child was two years old. An autopsy revealed she had suffered injuries to her knees, chest and head. She had died from a blunt force trauma to the head. There were also signs of sexual abuse on her body and she was severely malnourished. The coroner wasn't able to determine if she was Mexican, 
although it is believed the girl could have been of Central American descent. At first, police thought that the little girl could have been homeless or belonging to a poor family. However, inside the suitcase, they found two sets of branded clothes. The child was also wearing earrings and a bracelet. Based on this, authorities do not believe she lived on the streets or belonged to a poor family. In the following weeks, her photo was published in the newspapers and media, hoping a family relative would be able to recognize the child. Her photo and DNA profile were also sent to all morgues and police stations in the country to try and match them with the bodies and files they had. Police believed it was possible that her mother could have been murdered as well. But nothing came out of it. It was found that the suitcase had been dumped at the sidewalk a few days before it was found but had been ignored as people thought it belonged to a homeless man. A man was captured on the CCTV with the suitcase loitering in the area before dumping it. However, it is unclear if he was responsible for the child's murder. The man has not been identified yet and remains the only lead in the case. The little girl was given the name Angela and buried in the local cemetery. There is a reward of 300,000 Mexican pesos for any information that could help the police identify the little girl. Mario Amada was a 29-year-old man living with his girlfriend Paula in Los Angeles, California. In June of 1992, the couple decided to go on a vacation trip to Rosarito Beach, Mexico. Mario invited his brother Joe and Joe's girlfriend Debbie to accompany them on the trip. They arrived in Rosarito Beach at 1 a.m. on the morning of June 6, 1992. They had planned to stay at a condo belonging to one of Paula's relatives. They stayed up and partied late into the night. At around 3.30 a.m., Joe and Debbie decided to go to bed. Sometime around 7 a.m., the couple woke up to find Mario and Paula fighting. Shortly after, Mario entered Joe's room and told the couple that he wanted to leave and go back home. Joe told him to get some sleep. A few hours later, Mario and Paula seemed to have patched things up. Later that afternoon, Joe and Debbie went on a romantic drive along the coast of Baja, California, while Mario and Paula stayed at the condo. A few hours later, Mario and Paula got into another fight, and Paula kicked Mario out of the condo. However, Mario refused to leave. Soon, police arrived and Mario was taken to the police station for public drunkenness and disorderly conduct. He was placed in a holding cell but was not formally charged with a crime. Joe and Debbie arrived at the condo at around 6.30 p.m. and found the door locked and the key to the condo that was usually kept underneath the mat was missing. They talked to the maid and she told them that the police had been there while they were away. Just moments later, four police officers arrived at the condo and asked the couple if they could speak to Paula. However, Paula was nowhere to be seen. Debbie, finding it suspicious, followed the officers who went to the bar looking for Paula. The officers seemed to be frantically searching for Paula. A few minutes later, Paula returned to the condo and Joe and Debbie asked her about Mario's whereabouts. Paula said that she did not know. She did not tell them that the police had arrested Mario earlier that day. A couple of hours later, several police officers showed up at the condo again. They told Joe that his brother was in police custody but committed suicide in the cell. Joe went to the police station where he was shown a photo of Mario lying on the ground without his shirt. The police claimed he used the shirt to hang himself on a crossbar about three feet above the ground in the cell. Joe asked them why didn't they stop him. The police said that everyone was asleep. Joe found it strange as according to them, Mario died around 5 p.m. The Mexican authorities told Joe that until they perform an autopsy, they will not release Mario's body. So Joe had to return to the United States without Mario. 
A week later, Mexican authorities completed their autopsy and listed the cause of death as a loss of oxygen to the brain as a result of Mario hanging himself. Joe, suspicious of the suicide ruling, contacted the congressman Howard Berman. Berman suspected a cover-up. After Mario's body was returned to the United States, Joe hired a pathologist to perform a second autopsy on his brother. The autopsy revealed that Mario had suffered internal injuries to his liver, suggesting that Mario had been punched or struck with a blunt object in the upper abdomen. The examiner also stated that it was unlikely that Mario would have been able to hang himself in that condition. Joe and Congressman Berman believed that Mario was struck in the abdomen, resulting in serious injury. He was then hung to stage his death to look like a suicide. The Los Angeles coroner reviewed the autopsy results and concluded that Mario was most likely murdered. Another suspicious fact was that Mexican authorities did not contact the US consulate immediately after Mario's death, which violated international agreements. Congressman Berman contacted the President of Mexico and the President promised to reopen the case and launch a full investigation. In 1993, Mario's body was exhumed for another autopsy. This autopsy found evidence of rope fibers embedded in Mario's neck, suggesting that Mario was strangled or hung by a rope and not his own shirt. Four months later, a former Rosarito police officer, Jose Antonio Verduzco Flores, was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison for Mario's murder. Two witnesses claimed to have seen Jose enter Mario's cell and then saw him strangle Mario with his sweater. However, the conviction was overturned four months later, after other inmates claimed they had seen an officer beat up Mario but could not identify Jose as the attacker. There have been no suspects in the case since and it remains unsolved. <laughs>